Good afternoon, folks. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, what we'll be talking today is about optimizing block storage. Um, quick introductions first. Uh, my name is Manu Batra. I'm product manager for GCP Persistent Disk. With me here is Stanley Fang. He's the engineering manager for Persistent Disk, focusing mainly on performance. A couple of key points on what we'll be discussing today. We want to cover starting with what is Persistent Disk, a quick introduction. A quick detail around what are the feature sets with data management feature set, data protection feature sets, and getting into performance. Some of the recommended practices around how to optimize persistent disk performance with GCP. So we want to cover about some recommendations around that. And then Stanley will also be covering a specific use case around optimizing MySQL performance with a new feature that is released in beta with 16K blocks. And of course, uh, towards the end, we can take questions. And afterwards, too, we'll be hanging out. And please uh, reach out to us for anything specific. Starting with a good introduction around persistent disk. Uh, with GCP, you get many options around how you store data. You get uh, databases and many kinds of databases with in-memory relation databases, NoSQL data warehouses. And on the storage side, we have block, object, and file. In this session, we're mainly focusing on block storage for GCP, which is persistent disk. Persistent disk is a highly durable, high-performance block storage for GCP. And a couple of key facts around block storage is it's simple, fast, and flexible. The reason I say it's simple, flex, uh, fast, and flexible are around the need of do we need striping? How does it do a lot of the stuff on the back end versus uh, forcing the customers to do um, OS-level optimizations? It provides a virtual SCSI device. And it can scale from 1 gig to a 64 terabyte size itself. Getting into the block storage ties, with GCP, we have three different types of block storage. One is a local SSD. A local SSD can go up to 3 terabytes. It's mainly recommended as a high performance CRAD space because it's an epithermal storage. So it's local to the VM, and it's essentially a CRAD space, and it's priced around 8 cents per gig per month. Now, when we get into network-based PD, we have two different options. One is standard persistent disk and SSD persistent disk. The use cases around them for standard are more around large data processing workloads, around genomics processing and video editing. And it's essentially targeted towards a price-sensitive audience with four cents per gig per month. When we get into SSD, that is focused on our high-performance databases, like MySQL, SQL servers, Oracle, or any other database of choice. Uh, it is persistent, and it, uh, it usually runs around 17 cents per gig per month um, for the SSD persistent disk. There are some also data management features around it. You can, you can have, in, uh, it comes standard with encryption. It comes with snapshots. I'm going to talk later on what different types of snapshots are there. And some of the scalability functions are you can actually have 128 PDs uh, per VM, and each PD can be around 64 terabyte size. A couple of common patterns, how we think PD is used generally by customers. You can use PD as a boot device. You can use PD as a boot device and use it as a read-write volumes for your VMs. PD also allows to have it attached into multiple VMs as a read-only device. Stanley will be covering a couple of more use cases around specifically how you can use PD for data distribution around multiple VMs. And we also have a new feature which we're going to be releasing soon is around synchronous replicated PDs across zones. So this provides active-active replications across two zones in the same region in case of a PD failure. And I'll be covering more details in the following slides on that one, too. But these are the common patterns we see around how PD is attached to VM for different workload optimizations. Getting more detail into some of the data management features, I covered multi multi-reader support, so you can use PD in a read-only mode to share data across multiple VMs. PD snapshots are geo-replicated. You can take regional and multi-regional snapshots, and I'll talk more about that too. You can scale without interruption. So talking about simplicity and flexibility, you can actually scale a PD without having to detach it. You can scale it dynamically while it's attached. And of course, all PD it comes with automatic encryption across the board. Getting into more data protection features, 
uh, PD has snapshots, and the standard snapshots are copied over into GCS. So when you take a first snapshot, it is full, and every other snapshot can be incremental. Now, once the PD snapshot is taken, you can choose, do you want to store them in a regional bucket or a multi-regional bucket? One of the features that was asked for a long time and it just went um, into production is around PD snapshot scheduling. With snapshot scheduling, you can actually control the life cycle of a snapshot. How many snapshots do you want to take? How often do you want to uh, take? And, and how often do you want to keep or how long do you want to retain them? So you can define a retention policy. You can define a snapshot creation policy. And it can all work offline without having you to schedule with scripts or other tools outside of the core PD pieces. Getting into a bit more around uh, snapshot location. Snapshot location is a feature which is in beta. And this is more for customers who are focused around data locality. So if you're taking a snapshot and you're concerned about that my snapshot shouldn't leave certain localities, or uh, you want to maintain for either compliance or taxation or different purposes that uh, corporations have, you can actually control precisely where your snapshot is stored. You can say, my snapshot is taken from US Central and can go to US East 1. Or you can say, my snapshot is, stays in US, and I want to store them in a multi-regional US bucket. So this is truly targeted towards where you want to control data locality, but still want to control uh, have DR with snapshots. Another feature, uh, which is going to the end of the month, uh, it should be in our blog post too, is around synchronous replication. So PD um, has regional PD, which allows, which takes two copies of a PD in two different zones, and all the writes are synchronized in the backend. So before a write is sent across back to the host as acknowledged, the writes are exactly synchronized across both sides. This particular feature is more targeted towards applications which are highly sensitive to response to recovery point and recovery time objectives. Now, getting into performance basics, we can look at performance in multiple different dimensions. One dimension that I like to deep dive is IO density. So when you look at IOPS, PD standard provides 0.75 reads and 1.5 write IOPS per gig. And this metric is particularly important if you look at what's the maximum disk size do I need to achieve the full IOs that I need for my application. Same thing for PDSSD. You can get up to 30 IOPS per gig. And on, in the following charts, I'll show you kind of what's the ramp up for PD size versus the IOPS and megabytes per second ramp. One of the latest changes around PD standard is PD uh, standard had a bandwidth of 180 megabits per second for read and 120 uh, for writes. It just moved up to 240 reads and 240 writes. So that should help with a lot of throughput sensitive applications. For PD SSD, we're looking at 1.2 uh, gigs per second reads and 400 megabytes per second write. Now, I talked about IO density in terms of megabytes and IOPS. And if you look at this chart, you literally can reach peak throughput in terms of megabytes per second for a PD, a standard PD by, by attaching a 2 terabyte drive. Same thing for if you are using PD SSD for IO sensitive applications, you can achieve the peak with 2 terabytes also. So that essentially means you can actually optimize for throughput or megabytes per second, or throughput or IOPS, depending on what your application needs without having tons of spare capacity to get to that max number. Another criteria when looking at what are the different thresholds to achieve the peak performance is, how, what's the size of VM that I need to get to that peak? Now, if you look at PD standard, you, you only need four vCPUs to achieve the max performance on a PD standard. And for PD SSD, you can get up to there with 32 vCPUs, which is pretty aggressive in terms of uh, spare CPU cycles that you would have to spend getting to that levels. And it's, the slopes are, uh, you can get to the peak with just 32 in PD SSD. I'm going to get 
uh, I'm going to transfer control to Stanley for more details around performance. Thank you, Manu, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. A brief introduction about myself. I work on performance uh, of the persistent disk and focus on performance of the disk itself and also try to optimize uh, performance for different kind of workloads. So uh, today, uh, the first section will be uh, focused around uh, performance recommendations, what you can do to best utilize PD. So let's first start with a brief, very high level, uh, 30,000 feet view of a persistent disk architecture. Architecture. As you can see here, you have GCE VMs and you have persistent disk, and it shows up as a disk to the uh, GCE VMs, which are the rectangle boxes. And two key high-level takeaways you can have on this graph is, one is PD is a virtualized disk. It's a completely virtualized. Every copy of data, say for example, look at the blue copy. If you write logical copy to PD, it's sent back down to a massive scale backend physical storage system and it's replicated um, three-way or three-way equivalent. And then because it's uh, completely virtualized, it does not have a one-to-one -one mapping from a logical persistent disk to a particular physical resource. And it allows us to uh, innovate and to define some sort of unique feature that is um, unlikely to happen in a completely physical attached disk world. And the other um, takeaway you can have on this is uh, because we're built on top of a uh, Google internal massive scale distributed file system, it allows us to scale PD. And we do uh, a lot of optimization for random writes. And also in terms of reads, we try to read from the fastest copy of those three. Um, so move on to some of the additional details about performance. And these are the details that we actually mention in our documentation. But sometimes we found out uh, lots of customers often you know, didn't pay much attention to those. So uh, first for the IOPS and the throughput limits, when we publish those limits, in order to measure IOPS, uh, you use 8 KB IOs or less. And then to measure throughput, make sure you use 256 KB IOs or larger, and use sequential IOs to match. And the third point is very interesting, is that we, uh, if you attach multiple disks of the same type, but different sizes to the same VM, the individual disk can achi actually achieve the same level of performance as the sum of those disks. For example, if we attach one 10 gigabytes disk and then one, one terabyte disk to the same VM, the 10 gigabyte disk can actually perform at the same level as one terabyte plus 10 gigabyte and if you're using that 10 gigabyte disk only. This gives you great flexibility in terms of IOs and in terms of how you use those disks. As long as you buy enough size, you will get those IOs, regardless on which disk you use those IOs on for that VM. Then the last point, which I will talk in great detail in the next slide, is about the concept of duplex. Duplex means you can achieve the read-write limit concurrently at the max. So for PDSSD, the throughput limit is actually duplex. That means you can achieve the read-write limit as documented at the same time at max. But the rest of the other limits, like PD standard throughput, is not duplex. IOPS limit is also duplex. Let's take a look at the detail. So again, this big table and a lot of data is actually copy-pasted from our documentation. And throughout the years, um, customers have had questions to us and will ask it, what does this mean and what is duplex? So I figure it's worth calling out today. And to just give a quick example and introduction um, of this concept. And so full duplex means maximum limits for read and write can be achieved simultaneously. If you look at the lower right corner of this graph, as you can see, uh, this table, as you can see, it's very easy to understand. For SSD read write throughput limit, you can achieve 240 megabytes at the same time. If you keep hitting the disk with maximum read and write, both sides can reach 240. Now, what does not duplex mean? Not duplex means you can take a look at the example of the standard persistent disk read write limits. So if you do read only, you can do 240. If you do write only, you can do 240. But what happens if you do read and write at the same time? Now let's assume if you have 50% reads, 50% writes, then proportionately both limits will be reduced to the middle, which is 120 and 120. So that's how you can understand um, read write mixed and which is called non-duplex. So of all these limits, IOPS limit, throughput limits, only the PDSSD throughput limit is full duplex. 
Um, so which is, uh, you know, you can reach 1.2G for reads at max and uh, 400 megabytes for reads, uh, for writes. So now let's uh, switch topic to application level tuning and what you can do at a high level in your application to make sure you can fully utilize the disk. So uh, first of all, uh, always try to ensure that you issue enough concurrent IOs to reach maximum IOPS. So the num number of concurrent IOs is sometimes also known as QDAPs. If you use FIO frequent enough, you will know the concept. So always try to ensure QDAPs of at least one for every 800 to 1,000 IOPS. For example, if you want to hit 12,000 IOPS, then you want to make sure their application can have at least 15 IOs outstanding at any time. So if you're running a MySQL database, probably that means you probably want to configure your page cleaner thread to be 15 or above, so there will always be that many IOs outstanding. So for maximum throughput, make sure you use 256 KB or larger IOs and do sequentials. Um, for, um, for your typical Hadoop workload, that shouldn't be a problem. So the next uh, topic is about enabling discard or trim. And for many of you who have a physical word SSD uh, experience, you know trim command or discard command is highly recommended for physical SSD device, which helps uh, them to reduce the write application effect. And trim is generally also helpful uh, for better performance for PD, although it's for a completely different reason. But the other aspect I want to mention here is about trim actually helps you to reduce your persistent disk snapshot size in the sense that, you know, if you don't enable trim, what happens is when you delete a logical file at the file system level, file system just changes the metadata to indicate that file has been deleted. And the fact that those physical blocks will still appear as used at the PD layer. So if you take a snapshot on the PD, all those deleted files are actually also included in your snapshot. But if you enable the trim command, um, all those deleted file would, uh, deleted blocks would have been discarded and your snapshot size would be much smaller. So to enable trim, you can do the dash O discard option to mount. So here are a few things you don't have to do to optimize performance for PD. One is PD is not an uh, oven at all. Uh, you don't have to preheat it uh, in the sense that, for example, if you download a restore snapshot to a new PD after the snapshot restoration is done, you can just start to read from it directly and it gets full performance. And then the other aspect uh, was uh, Manu just mentioned a few moments ago is that you don't need to raid multiple TDs to reach uh, the maximum performance, just provision a large enough PD and that should give you enough performance. And the last one about in this section is about uh, sharing read-only data across multiple uh, VMs. So you can create a PD, you can have like software packages you want to distribute to tens of VMs in a zone and those that PD will be uh, in a read-only mode. You can attach that PD using this command dash dash mode RO to many, many, uh, to a few VMs, like tens of VMs. So, and then those VMs can all read from that PD easily. Um, this is suitable for a small scale distribution of static content within a zone. Now, if you have a large scale, huge scale distribution, or if you want cross zone distribution, then consider using uh, Google Cloud Storage, GCS. And all if you have file level sharing, uh, especially read-write file sharing, then we have a new product called Google Cloud Firestore you can use. So uh, then, of course, in this particular scenario, PD SSD is highly recommended here because you're going to issue lots of read IOs to this shared PD, and SSD is more super suitable for that purpose. Okay, the last slide applies if you uh, in happen to use PD as a raw device without uh, uh, formatting a file system on top of it. Uh, it's called misaligned writes. So basically make sure that when you do writes to the raw device, the writes is al always aligned at the physical block uh, size boundary. If you look at those 16 KB, uh, 6 KB writes that's not aligned, the red block are the block of the existing content that we have to maintain. The way we have to um, implement it is through a process called read, modify, write, in the sense that we have to read the old block and modify it with your new payload for the misaligned portion and then write it back. This makes the write process extremely slow. So, all right, 
So now let's move on to the next section, which is about introducing an example of how you can optimize a particular workload called MySQL database using a new feature called 16KB physical block size PD, which is currently in beta. So as we optimize performance and introducing new features for PD, we always keep in mind that we want to do it that can actually benefit the real world application. And of the real world application, MySQL or database application is fairly important to many of our customers, and MySQL is a very common uh, database application. So let's go over this example and let's go over what this physical block size, 16 KB physical block size PD means. So um, for persistent, what is a physical block size? What it means in the context of, in the context of persistent disk? So for persistent disk, physical block is the unit at which writes have atomicity. Atomicity means you have all or nothing semantics. A 16 KB write, um, if it's aligned, if it's written to a 16 KB physical block size PD, you, to, you will be ensured to either write nothing in a failure case, your VM crash, or your application crash, you will write either nothing or write all in a success successful case. Now, the default physical block size of a persistent disk is 4 KB. And the 16 KB physical block size has just recently been added, like uh, probably a month ago, as a beta feature. Um, so then the next question, obviously, is what do I use a 16 KB uh, PD for? And then it is really designed for your MySQL database workload that is write heavy. Now, if you happen to run other databases, and for example, uh, SQL Server or Oracle and those databases, if you can change those database data page size to be 16 KB and then use PD, uh, for many of those databases have a uh, mode to use the uh, block storage as a raw device, then you can potentially also benefit from this uh, 16 KB PD. So what's the problem? What's the problem we try to solve at MySQL layer is with this 16KB uh, PD? Here's the problem. Here is a typical OLTP run for those uh, of you who use MySQL and manages MySQL. Uh, uh, the sysbench OLTP is a standard benchmarking method to run um, to benchmark the performance of MySQL database. This is an eight hour run uh, with 512 concurrent connections, fairly heavy. And as you can see, at the second phase of the run, the uh, y-axis is the performance, TPS. Uh, during the second half of the run, the performance varies greatly. The database um, is you know, essentially not that useful to you and because the performance varies by like 5x, 6x, and all that. Right. So now let's just do a quick preview on what you can achieve with a 16 KB PD and uh, configure the MySQL to disable that <laughs> double write feature. And so in the middle of the graph is uh, the performance after using 16 KB PD. Um, as you can see, it's more stable. It's a little bit higher. It's a bit higher than what's the lower right corner, which was before on a 4 KB PD. And then this is also our internal uh, regression test tool. And um, this is for the last February and early March. The blue lines here are 16 KB performance on MySQL running on 16 KB PD. And the red lines here are MySQL running on 4 KB PD. And 16 KB performance is a bit higher and more stable than the red lines, than the 4 KB ones. So, OK, now let's just dig a little bit deeper for those of you, uh, of you who um, never um, touched MySQL before. This might be boring, but you know, le uh, let's just see where the problem is and why the 16 KB PD helps solve that problem. The problem here is if uh, internally inside MySQL, um, this graph plotted is what's called a flash lag. Flash lag means that you know, how much lagging behind is the 30-page flash versus the log file. So here you can see the uh, MySQL log file has grown to the ceiling, which is 820 megabytes in this case, and MySQL is uh, in a sync flash state. In that state, MySQL will not take new incoming uh, mutations unless it can find a 30-page to flush, make room in the log file, and then take the mutation. This leads to the initial problematic graph where you see huge variation of performance because the database is itself is in, in a stop and go mode. So in order to control flash lag, we want to make sure that the 30-page flush can be done at a rate that's higher than incoming write rate, then inside MySQL there's an option called double write. If we can disable double write, then that means we can reduce the 30-page flush rate by half, essentially doubling the IOPS you can get on the 30-page flush front. So then the next question will become, what is double write? And how does a 16KB PD help, help you disable double write? So double write. 
um, InnoDB is a MySQL storage engine. InnoDB double write is to basically, when it needs to flush a dirty page, it actually write that page twice in two different locations on disk. Because it does, it needs to do that is to guard against a torn page situation. A torn page situation happens if you write a 16 KB page on a traditional 4 KB physical block device. During failure mode, maybe only part of the page may be successfully written on the disk, like say 4 KB or 8 KB or 12 KB, right? When that case happens, the page is torn, is lost, is part only partially written. You can't even replay the transaction log onto that page to reconstruct the new page because the old page is essentially overwritten and corrupted. So that's why InnoDB needs to write the uh, when they flush the dirty page, you need to write twice. First time to a backup buffer called a uh, double write buffer, the second time to the actual place. If the second write is torn and corrupted, they can use the first write to restore it. Now, if we can build a 16 KB write atomic, uh, atomic write path from database all the way to the disk, then we can avoid the need to do this kind of double write because all the 16 KB uh, writes would have been atomic. It will happen end to end all the way to the disk, have all or nothing semantics. So that's where you can use 16 KB PD for. Um, here is a list of steps. Here are the details. I'm not going to repeat those steps. You can just Google best practices for 16 KB persistent disk and MySQL, and those steps will show up in a document. Um, but one uh, quick thing I want to call out here is that the ability to create a 16 KB persistent disk is very unique on Google Cloud. It loops back to the initial architecture graph in that persistent disk is a fully uh, virtualized storage block device solution built on top of a massive distributed file system on the back end. Because it's fully utilized, it, it's possible that we make this kind of features that um, to customize a property called physical block size that in the physical world would have been an attribute of the underlying physical device that is extremely hard to customize. So here is the 16 KB PD, and here are the steps you can follow to uh, safely disable MySQL double write by using a 16 KB PD. Um, one last thing I want to call out that throughout the steps, there's a step mentioning that you need to use container optimized OS, uh, which is called COS. Uh, it's, it is uh, Google curated and it's supported by a Google team here, and it's designed for Google Compute Platform. And one thing I want to mention here is that it is also used by Google Cloud SQL VMs. Um, the reason we want to use cost image if we want if we want to uh, use 16 KB for MySQL is that cost image qualification process has built-in tests to ensure that the Linux kernel layers between the file system and the disk do not split, break, misalign the six uh, writes across 16 KB boundaries. Uh, so that is how we ensure there's an end-to-end -end atomic 16 KB write path all the way to the disk. Mm -hmm.